appreciate your taking the time to hear um, what we're going to be discussing today, which is satellite security, uh, attack vectors in orbit. Uh, title of a blog post a colleague of mine at Trend put on our uh, Simply Security site some time ago. Um, in the course of the presentation, I'm going to spend about a third of the time up front talking about various um, satellites. That's the cool stuff about what's going on out there and what have we learned from each of these. The rest of the presentation is going to take a look at what the vulnerabilities are and what we can do to, uh, to remediate, to fix it. Uh, so in a, in a way, um, this is kind of a bait and switch. Okay. Most of it's going to be talking about satellites, but the messages you're going to hear apply to industrial control systems generally. So this is actually an IoT uh, security presentation. It's just that it's really cool IoT stuff. Okay, so uh, what we're going to do first is talk some about um, satellites. Um, the first satellite, uh, I was five <laughs> when this thing went up. Um, not very big, uh, 190 pounds, uh, 22 inches in diameter. Um, it was up for broadcasting for three weeks and it lasted for three months and it went into uh, the atmosphere and burned up. Uh, Sputnik uh, caused a stir. It had a one watt transmitter and it broadcast a series of beeps that indicated the internal temperature uh, of the device and uh, pressure inside it. So what it demonstrated was that we can put stuff up there and sustain it and talk to it and anybody could listen to it. It was broadcast over clear channel. If you had a shortwave set, you could dial into 20 megahertz or 40 megahertz and you could listen to the beeps coming from space, the telemetry. Um, that hasn't changed. <laughs> Much of what goes on between the Earth and satellites is not encrypted. If you know the protocol, you can read what's going on up there. And that's a significant problem that shows up again and again when you take a look at what we've learned about satellites. Echo 1 was an interesting satellite. It was just a big balloon. Um, it was uh, 100 feet across. And it had a reflective surface, uh, and it had a powder inside that sublimated to maintain pressure over time. It was up there uh, for, um, it went up in uh, 62, it went into the atmosphere in May of 68. So it was up there for six years, and it was there to bounce uh, radio waves off of. So it was the original bent pipe. Satellite engineers refer to communication satellites as bent pipes. They take the input, they broadcast the output, and they do no processing on the contents of the message whatsoever. There's no interpretation, there's no decrypting or re-encrypting of the traffic. It simply is a mirror for, trans, uh, for communication. The thing we learned from uh, this is that there is weather in space and it was pushed around by solar winds. It's a considerable amount more than people expected. And so there was uh, learning about the physics of flight in space, not the only, but the first. Uh, Telstar went up. Uh, this is a telecommunications satellite. It was spin stabilized, so it has multiple um, receiving and transmitting antennas and solar panels that uh, kept it alive. Uh, it went up in 62 and it's still in orbit, although it became inactive uh, quite some time ago. Um, the Van Allen radiation belts were activated by nuclear weapons testing and that knocked the thing off for a while. So we learned a bit about the physics of Van Allen radiation belts and what's going on beyond the atmosphere. We used to think, you know, the atmosphere stops at 50 miles and beyond that, nothing. Absolutely wrong. So we learned from this that uh, space weather will have an impact on transmissions. And we hadn't yet discovered about um, the impact of solar flares, sunspot activity. Um, 11 years later, Skylab went up. Anybody remember the uh, Here Comes Skylab bit that John Belushi did on Saturday Night Live? I see a couple of folks that have gray hair. Yes. Um, the thing was up there, it set a whole bunch of distance records. What we learned about that is you really have to take care and you have to be ready to fix things. You may notice that one of the two solar panels there on the bottom didn't deploy. Uh, so they had to rig a way to uh, shield the uh, living quarters. That's what that folded uh, gold foil is. Um, the uh, heat buildup was significantly more than they thought. We uh, used that in the space shuttles. They would open the bay doors to let heat come out. So another piece of physics out there. And again, uh, transmissions were uh, not encrypted. You could listen to what was going on with Skylab. Um, next came Voyager. Now this is a bit of a trick because Voyager isn't a satellite. Um, 
It's not orbiting anything. It's just uh, it is now um, over 12, over 13 billion miles away. Um, it has, on the end of that uh, pole there at the bottom, uh, it has uh, plutonium, which generates heat through a thermocouple that provides the electricity which powers the satellite. Half of the plutonium is gone. Um, it's now down to about 200 watts. It has three computers with an aggregate processing capacity of about 160 thousand instructions per second, and it's got less than a quarter meg of storage. Because of the distance, it takes 20 hours for an EM signal to get to Voyager. So if you want to set up an SSL link, that's going to be six days. Okay. Uh, really, really remote. Plus, the technology was built you know, 40 years ago. It's uh, very, very primitive. And yet, it's still out there. And if you can tune to the right frequency, you actually listen to the thing. Um, so this is the, the, the base upon which we've built our satellite infrastructure. And the things we've learned from this, limitations of power, how do you restore them, um, how do you keep it um, operable, what do you need to do about the weather around that, this has uh, come up again and again. And um, one last point, those things that our satellites adopt different orbital structures. You can choose where you want to be when you, you know, circuit the Earth. Now, the orbits are generally speaking elliptical. A circular orbit is one where the two points of the ellipse meet in the center of the Earth. If your circular orbit is far enough out so that the orbital path of your satellite equals the rotational speed of the Earth, you're in a geosync orbit. And so you're standing there, you look up, and the satellite doesn't seem to move because it's actually moving fast enough to stay over you as, as you move. So when the um, sun goes down, or more correctly, when the horizon moves up, uh, the satellite is, in fact, with you. At the other end, uh, you have the low Earth orbit. These are guys that are only uh, you know, 2,000 kilometers or less, a couple hundred miles up there. Um, these guys have very fast orbits. You've got to move quicker to stay in orbit when you're up there. So they're traveling close to 17, 18,000 miles an hour. Um, and as a result, they only traverse a particular place on Earth for five or six minutes. So if you want to communicate quickly, you want to get something up there and back quickly, you want a low Earth orbit satellite. But if you want to have a conversation that lasts more than a few minutes every orbit, and the orbit could be like an hour and a half, uh, you're going to need a constellation of these. And that's the design philosophy behind Iridium and all of the uh, satellite uh, telecom systems. You'll have bunches of these. And so you talk to one satellite, and then when it moves at a range, your conversation is ported to the next satellite. Kind of like when you're driving on your cell phone, you go from cell to cell to cell. Another way of thinking about it is that an LEO satellite constellation is virtualized because you're talking to different pieces of it as demand requires. In this case, you're standing still and the satellite's moving. The other two, Middle Earth orbit, that's for um, satellites that are doing uh, jobs like surveying from fairly high up. And uh, Helios, um, the high Earth orbit satellites tend to have very radical elliptical ones. So they'll come very near the Earth at one point and they'll go way the heck out into space. Those are used for um, solar observations. Uh, just for context, um, Hubble, is in a, a low Earth orbit. And we're going to take a look and drill down into a Hubble to learn something about the architecture here. I'm kind of a fan of Hubble. I think this is a cool spacecraft. It went up. Uh, it had a vision problem. So they went up and fixed it. I was like, yes. Let's go up there and correct it. What you see on this uh, uh, spacecraft is uh, the uh, door, which protects the optics. You don't want to point the Hubble at the sun. It will go blind. Um, you see the um, solar panels uh, above and below. These are on axes. They can rotate. So you can tune the amount of power the satellite receives. And the tuning and the decision when to open and close the hatch, those things are controlled through telemetry. And so if you're an InfoSec type person, you'd say, gee, I hope those are encrypted. One would, wouldn't one. Um, on the top and on the bottom, on the ends of those uh, poles, which are, I think, about 10 feet long, you see the directional uh, high-capacity antennas. Those are the things that Hubble uses to talk about what it's seen. And on the bottom, you can just barely see, it looks like a white styrofoam cup. That's actually an omnidirectional antenna. There are two of them. Uh, and they're for handling telemetry and their emergency backup in case the uh, 
uh, high capacity antennas go on. So Hubble takes a picture and it sends it down to Earth. Mm, not quite. Hubble takes a picture and then it sends it over the high capacity link up to the tracking and data relay satellite of which there are nine. And yes, the temptation is to call it a TARDIS, but they don't actually call it a TARDIS. Uh, these guys are in geosync orbit. So they're 22,900 miles above mean sea level. So right off the bat, you say, well, gee, uh, that's not instantaneous, is it? No, no, it is certainly not. If you are in a geosync orbit, then you are about 120 milliseconds from the surface of the Earth as the EM wave flies, which means if you're thinking about 5G and satellites, the first thing you're going to say is, I can't use those because one of the goals of 5G is to have response time of under one millisecond. So geosync is off the board as a class of satellite activity for supporting, uh, supporting 5G. So anyway, the Hubble sends its data up to the TARDIS and the TARDIS sends it down to Earth. Now there are originally two reception stations. There's uh, White Sands and there's one in Guam. Uh, when this graphic was put together, um, that was it. There are actually now two uh, stations in White Sands. The one in Guam is still active and they have a fourth one in uh, Baltimore. So there are actually four ground stations that communicate with this. And the network of the nine uh, geosync uh, satellites, that's the NASA Space Network. And they handle a lot of stuff. So you're looking at a fairly complex uh, communications infrastructure here. Um, I haven't even shown the path for the data. How does the Hubble figure out what to look at? Well, somebody sitting in the Space Telescope Science Institute, which controls and runs the Hubble, will say, let's point it at this, sends the commands to Goddard, which sends them to one of the two ground stations, which sends the telemetry up to the TARDIS, which then tells the Hubble via the uh, Omni antennas, you need to point in this direction. And the software will make sure that the solar panels adjust and that the you know, baffle stays closed. And this point was one of the first things about the Hubble that I hadn't really thought through, but it's actually quite cool. How does it move? You're essentially weightless, you're, you're drifting. Um, what about using a rocket? Bad idea, because the Hubble needs to have a clear view of whatever it's looking at. So you can't use any kind of rocket or jet. So what they do is they, <laughs> they use gyroscopes. If you've ever played on with a big gyroscope, you know, you take a bicycle wheel and hold it in your hand, spin it like crazy, and then try to turn. If you try to turn, because of the spin on the wheel, you will get resistance. And so they use electrical power to rev up three, they call them reaction engines, and then they try to turn the thing one way, the reaction sends it the other way. They well, gee, aren't they going to run out of power? Nope. This is all cellular, uh, all solar, right? They can get as much power as they want whenever they want. So the vulnerable components here, in addition to the angle of the solar panel, you don't want to burn out the battery by pointing them square under the sun, and the baffle and the radios, is the durability of those gyroscopes. And those, those little puppies are doing pretty well, 40, uh, a long time up there. Um, we're beginning to have problems with the gyroscopes, so Hubble's days are numbered, but we've got new satellites coming online in the next few years. So uh, these are the ground stations, images of the satellites. Uh, F1, F2, and F4 are not there. There actually are nine geosync satellites. That's their relative position. And uh, the White Sands and the Guam locations are, are shown. There's two in White Sands, and there's one over in Bethesda, Maryland, uh, near the uh, Chesapeake Bay, which you can see. This is what the TARDIS does. Um, it's got solar panels for power, angled. It's got single axis antennas with very high capacity. It's got two omni antennas for telemetry, low volume signals, and a bunch of uh, uplink downlink. Those little hexagonal uh, panels themselves are also uh, transmission and reception. They use different frequencies. When I first built this pitch, I had a whole bunch of information on EM spectrum. It's cool to see, I can give you references. Uh, I decided not to include it because it's a radio wave. And the first thing about radio transmission is radio transmission does not have an expectation of privacy. And that's the, the legal term that means, am I allowed to eavesdrop? 
you are not allowed to eavesdrop a telephone conversation. If I pick up my phone and call somebody, I'm expecting that that's private. If I pick up a ham radio and broadcast something, I surrender that. So RF signals are not private. So if you want privacy, you're going to have to do something, encryption or, or something else. So what do we use these things for? Um, we use them for uh, communications. We send messages to satellites. If it's a constellation, they talk to each other, send it back down. We use them for status. We have satellites that will tell us where our position is on Earth, the GPS system. Those are not geosync, by the way. Those are in medium Earth orbit. Okay, so they traverse slowly. So when you, uh, in the early days, if you had GPS location, it would say looking for satellite, got one, got two, got three, and now we know where you are. Well, they move around. Um, time. Uh, anybody who was a ham radio operator may remember WWV, a station that broadcasts time signals from Colorado. Observations. Uh, what's going on with the weather? Where is that hurricane? Uh, hard to imagine a time when we didn't have that kind of advance warning of, of hurricanes. Um, how are the crops doing? Are there um, diseases forming? Uh, does this field look low? Is this flood likely to cause damage? And of course, spying, disaster analysis, and exploring space itself. Lots of issues for satellites. Um, in 5G, we see two roles uh, and industrial OT. The first is backhaul, again, remembering the distance problems. Speed of light is 186,000 miles a second, which means 186 miles in a millisecond. 186 miles is about as low as you can go in low Earth orbit before you begin getting problems with, uh, with friction. So you're more than a millisecond away to get to a satellite. So you're not going to use satellites for real time. If you try to talk to, well, to take the most extreme case, if you try to talk to a geosync satellite 22,000 miles up, 120 milliseconds away, and you're using that for your position on the highway, let's say you're on the Merritt Parkway, 60 miles an hour, that's 88 feet per second. The return time for that signal means that your position will be off by 44 feet. The Merritt Parkway isn't that wide, and the cars are rarely that widely spaced. So GPS-based control of automated vehicles is a backup. It's for backhaul. It's for information gathering. It's not for real time. Uh, satellites are going to have the real time. Now, one uh, big area that could be quite helpful is downloading SIM updates. Uh, satellites have great coverage, so if you've got a bunch of IoT devices, say, across a large factory or across a, a region and you want to update the SIM information, you can blast it down from, uh, from a, a satellite. What kinds of threats are there? Well, this is a generalized schematic of what we saw with Hubble. It's simplified because we don't have the satellite talking to another satellite, but shows the main components from the Earth's perspective. We have telemetry to control the motion uh, and position of the satellite on the left-hand side, and on the right-hand side, we have the stuff, the data that it's sending and receiving. Um, in this chart, the vulnerable areas are shown in gray and black. Um, it is astonishing to me the range of vulnerabilities that exist when you start talking about satellites. The assumptions, engineers are governed by one principle, which is safety. And second to that is the availability of the service they're providing. So when you build a system like this, you want to make sure that it's up as much as possible. And if it fails, it fails in a way that doesn't put people or stuff at risk to the extent possible. They don't think about information security uh, principles. And this shows up again and again, even in analyses of problems. There was a study done in 2002 about how vulnerable are our satellites. And they came up with um, two charts that summarize the results. Here's the first the unintentional threats to satellites. Well, we could have stuff happening on the ground. We could have stuff happening in space. We could have interference. We've learned about solar wind. We've learned about uh, radiation, the Van Allen belts, and so on. Um, what's missing from this chart? Do we have any programmers in the room? <laughs> How about software defects? How about design problems? Let me tell you about Y2K. <laughs> okay, and the reason that's relevant is because the GPS satellites figure out what time it is by referencing an internal time source. And one of the components of the internal time source is a 10-bit counter that counts the weeks from January 1980. 
stop and think. 1024, 52 weeks in a year. Oh, darn. It rolled over in 1999. It's rolling over again on April 6th, okay, a couple of weeks from now. Any GPS satellite that is still running a 10-bit weeks counter is hosed. There is a fix. You have to go to a 13-bit counter. Okay? That is a design defect, and it is most definitely an unintentional threat uh, to a satellite. There are other classes. Um, uh, by uh, a physicist named uh, Kessler back in the 70s said, gee, we've got a lot of satellites in low Earth orbit. You know, now the likelihood that any one given satellite is going to hit any other given satellite is small. But if we have any math majors in the room, how many math and programming? Wow, my brother. Um, how, what's the likelihood that two of us have the same birthday? with about what, 70, 80 people in the room, better than 90%. Now, the likelihood that you have the same birthday as me is relatively small, but the likelihood that there are two people that have the same birthday, that gets pretty high once you get beyond about 30 or 40 folks. We got a bunch of satellites. This is a picture from a couple of years ago about satellite orbits. Uh, we do have a system, it's called Socrates. It tracks everything in space that is over 10 centimeters in size. Um, there are 28,000, I'm sorry, 24,000 that it um, tracks. Uh, 18,000 are publicly available. Um, the other um, 6,000 are secret, uh, the military happens. And Socrates actually has planning software in it. You can go to uh, the this, this site. I think I have a link to it. If not, I was looking at it this morning. Uh, you can actually go to a site and it'll tell you what the 10 most likely collisions are in the next week. High probability and the ones that are close miss. Um, 10 years ago in February, the system said, it looks like we're gonna have two satellites that are gonna pass 564 meters apart. 564 meters. Um, one satellite was a defunct uh, Soviet era communication satellite and the other satellite was uh, Iridium satellite number 33. And it turned out they were correct, but they were off by um, 564 meters. And uh, the two satellites collided, generating 2,000 pieces of debris, which are still in orbit. That's the ones that are over a centimeter in size, traveling at about 18,000 miles an hour. They had to move the International Space Station up to get out of the debris path. And there's some really cool graphics and animation that I can point you to that show you how all this stuff happens. But the fact is, every time we launch a satellite, we now have to take into account what else is in its orbit and what other collisions have happened. Uh, in 2007, uh, the Chinese demonstrated a hunter-killer satellite. And as a result of that successful test, uh, they created 100,000 pieces of small debris, smaller than 10 centimeters, so not tracked by Socrates, but big enough to cause a problem. Just ask George Clooney. Um, intentional threats to satellites. What, what can you do to them? Well, you can mess with the control system. You can jam it. Um, you can physically harm the ground station. You can sabotage stuff. You can, you can bribe an operator. Always easier than trying to crack, you know, 256 DES. We've actually got a program, Restore L. Uh, it's um, not gone up yet, I don't believe. It's a satellite, the thing on the left, is going to fix Landsat 7, which went dark, and by adding power uh, and uh, directional control, basically refueling it, uh, it's going to be reactivated. So far, only ISS and Hubble have ever been reprovisioned. This gives us the ability to grab onto a satellite and reprovision it, assuming it's, you know, USB-C compatible, um, or grab onto it and push it into the Earth, right? Push it to a different orbit that sends it down to... Uh, down to land. So here are the kinds of things that we're going to be worrying about. Jamming a signal. That's a DDoS attack against the traffic. Uh, you just flood the information so the satellite doesn't know what to listen to or what to believe. Uh, eavesdropping is intercepting the communications channel and hearing what's going on. I can listen to your sat phone conversations if you don't encrypt them. Um, hijacking is taking over the content. This was done um, famously in Florida in the 90s. Somebody was upset about their paid uh, 
digital um, TV satellite-based subscription, and so they took over the subscription and they put, I think, some porn or something. And then there's control hacking, where they actually take over the satellites and move it around. Okay. Again, you need to either do it at the ground station or you do it with a bus. You need some equipment to do this. You need to make the satellite think that you're the ground station, or that if it's a constellation, you need to make the satellite think that you're a satellite also. Uh, we saw similar attacks, if you happen to see the pitch uh, yesterday on the uh, complex IoT environments, the home hacking, you add a device to the configuration and now you're able to mess with the automation software as well as the other devices in the configuration. And unfortunately, these kinds of problems are not rare. I didn't want to put a list of all of them because there have been many, many, many going back uh, 30 years. But this is a list that was put together in 2012 of the publicly known intrusions into NASA. I've bold-faced the ones that actually hit satellites and caused them to mess around. In 98, a satellite that was jointly managed by the US and Germany was turned towards the sun. Specifically, its um, solar panels were angled to be normal to the sun's light. So it overloaded the batteries and fried the satellite. Uh, and starting in 2007, we had a series of control takeovers. Landsat a couple of times, the Terra EOS system a couple of times, the satellite was moved around, um, and a Trojan disrupted <laughs> the International Space Station <laughs> as they were running old windows uh, up on the ISS. Um, guy brought up a USB because he wanted to bring some pics back for his, I guess. Um, in addition to those, in February of 99, the United Kingdom had a network of satellites. It's still up there, but they're now on a new generation. Yes, they actually called it Skynet. You know? So we have Skynet, we have TARDIS. I mean, your imagination is unlimited if you're doing space. So in February, uh, hackers took over one of these satellites and uh, moved it around and demanded ransom. Now, I have the references to what went on in the public press. There was a, a note in The Guardian, there was a note in the Telegraph, and then a month later, uh, an official went on to say, no, there was no such problem, nothing happened, the satellite's exactly where it should be. That was contradicted by independent observations by, uh, you know, amateur astronomers uh, in the UK. The satellite really did move. I was working at Gartner at the time, and one of my colleagues was attending the uh, Naval War College uh, series of seminars in Rhode Island, and there, uh, he happened to meet a senior member of British intelligence, and he asked the fellow, what actually happened? And the guy said, and I'm sorry I don't have a reference for those of you in the press. The guy said, oh yes, we found them. They went away. So um, due process is all well and good, um, but don't don't mess with anybody's uh, satellites. Um, in 2000, this is kind of funny, the French uh, intelligence agencies were meekening. They messed with a GPS system and they caused some US and British tanks that were on maneuvers in Greece to get lost. <laughs> uh, just, you know, intramural fun, uh, locker room talk, you know what I mean? Um, so the vulnerabilities are, are uh, rife. Now, so what do we do about them? Uh, two classes of solutions uh, come to mind. The first are the threat specific. Like, oh, they're going to do this? Well, we should do that. This is a classic, what the capability maturity model calls a level one response. There's a problem. Oh, gosh, what do we do about the problem? They're trying to jam the satellites. Well, one great way to avoid jamming is to use spe spread spectrum to detect and say, okay, we're going to hop to a different frequency. And then you do that a lot. This was. Uh, Hedy Lamarr's invention for uh, torpedo guidance systems during World War II. Spread spectrum technology gives you a measure of security because you don't know, you may intercept a bit of a signal, but it's not gonna be there very long, so you have to retune your receivers. Spread spectrum is a great way to avoid um, uh, jamming technology. You can harden against um, EM, uh, radiation shielding. The probe that went down to um, Jupiter had a one centimeter thick titanium shell. Um, so it was able to continue broadcasting long after it actually began going through the atmosphere. Um, there was a uh, satellite, uh, or not a satellite rather, a, a vehicle that went into the corona. It had a very thick um, shield, 
which allowed it to withstand uh, the heat uh, as it actually went into the sun and continued broadcasting. So you can do shielding. Uh, GPS authentication, the signal actually can give you some measure of confidence that you're listening to a real satellite. Uh, your, your equipment, the, your end of it has to be smart. And if you stop and think about how many GPS receivers there are in the world, you know, step one, every car, step two, every phone, uh, you realize the scope of the problem in terms of sustaining upgrades. Um, more importantly, with the larger uh, capacity memory devices, with better um, technology both in uh, batteries and in uh, efficient solar cells, uh, we can now power more sophisticated processors. And the current generation of processors uh, have coprocessors that are in secure spaces for um, signature processing, encryption, code signing, and so on. Um, there has been talk, in fact, I think there was at least one session this week here about how you can sneak malware into this secure area and thereby avoid detection. Uh, so it's, a, as you know, an arms race. Um, identity management for things. Um, you want to know that when I'm giving you, Mr. Satellite, some information that you're the satellite I want, and the satellite has to know that I'm the control system that it wants to listen to. Uh, detection and blocking of fake signals, again, demanding significant processing power, but uh, a way to do it. These are threat specific. Come up with a new threat, come up with a new uh, solution. A systemic approach um, would be much more uh, comprehensive and effective. Um, security orchestration, meaning you've got to be able to wheel the appropriate kinds of uh, protection in space in response to uh, change conditions uh, in the uh, in the device, in the satellite. Uh, as satellites get more complex, think of the TARDIS with its multitude of transmission frequencies, its multitude of missions, that thing has to have some fairly sophisticated um, detection and response to, uh, to stay afloat. They're, it's hard to get them up there. They're refreshing the system uh, now. There are new generations going up. Um, uh, the second point, uh, for those of you who never stumbled across this, ISO 7498 is the seven-layer OSI reference model. Physical data link, da 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 da. 7498-2 was developed at the same time. It asks the question, where do we apply security on those layers and what kind of security we sh should we apply? And it came up with these five functions. How do you prove you are who you say you are? How do you grant authorization to issue particular commands now that we know who you are? How do we preserve the confidentiality and integrity of the data? And finally, non-repudiation, which means if I talk to you, you can't deny having heard me, and you, uh, I can't deny having uh, sent the message. Um, we need much more monitoring and logging of transmission uh, traffic. This is coming on stream now, and making use of those secure chip architectures. The newer satellites that are going up do have encryption. They do have more sophistication in there. But 2007, 2008, the signals were being flown up in the clear. Um, Long-term solutions, and this is the switch part of the bait and switch. Satellites are just IoT devices. They're snazzy, they're wild at space, you know, but they're, they're IoT devices. They have a certain amount of capabilities. They're being integrated into uh, real-time IT systems. Um, and we need to do things. We need to apply the same discipline we have to uh, information security, privacy by design, uh, into these technologies uh, as well. From the point of view of next steps, uh, I would simply point out that the cost of a antenna is dropping following Moore's Law. For a while it didn't, but now it's back on track, which means that the bad guys can set up a fairly sophisticated antenna for a couple hundred bucks, uh, which means that these kinds of attacks will become much, much more common. And of course, as our dependence on this technology for 5G backhaul, uh, for SIM updates, uh, becomes more woven into the fabric, which I think is gonna be uh, 2020s or beyond. 5G is not right around the corner. Um, we're going to see um, state actors uh, taking advantage of these uh, weaknesses. The attack surfaces are widening as we get more up there. People are putting up tiny satellites. They're putting up bunches of them. Um, we're looking at um, techniques to actually capture some of that space junk and bring it down. Um, nets right, that'll sweep up uh, stuff. And there are areas where you just don't want to launch a satellite anymore. Um, 
industriality updates and 5G fringe coverage are going to require those, um, and the satellites are going to need to be secure. Um, and we are going to need regulation in the private sector. For the most part, each company that puts together a satellite uses its own security architecture. Uh, there are no standards, there is no baseline, there is no minimal set of security controls that we expect of satellite operators. Okay, so it's still very much in the industrial control system um, heritage. So what should we do? Well, the first thing is <laughs> upgrade your 13-bit weak counter, your GPS satellite. Um, for me, I'm not going to be flying on April 6th, just in case. Um, I'm not saying buy a generator, uh, but, you know, it, it could be a little dicey uh, when we go to that uh, new week. Uh, hard to make a firmware update on something that's traveling at 16,000 miles an hour, 300 miles above the Earth's surface. Um, next three months, if you're planning to use satellites, if, not that you should be, but if you do need them, you really need them, and if you're going to be doing this, uh, take a look at the value compared to what your business requirements are and say, how would you secure it if the environment were not secure? How would you use a dramatically new form of cloud technology if you could not guarantee that there were security around that of any kind? Okay, and this is basically, we're giving you, to use the early lingo, a curved pipe. Whatever you send up, we'll send back down. So it's up to you to make sure that that transmission is protected at both ends. And if you're going to do something with satellite, you really got to get the IT and the OPT people talking to each other. Life cycle considerations. Make sure that it's in there. Yeah, the satellite vendor you're looking at may be cheaper, but that may mean that they don't have as much functionality to support what you want to do uh, with security. Um, this is uh, some of the references that I used in developing the material. The presentation is up. Um, I have, uh, I can certainly take uh, any questions now, and thanks for your time and attention. Uh, we, the mics are live and they're recording, so if you could come to the mic, or if, if you can't, I'll repeat the question, but please. Um, so why no encryption on the communication systems in the past? It was just a weight issue or a uh, hardware processing issue or what? There were actually three considerations. Uh, the hardware processing was certainly part of it. You know, you don't have a lot of available capacity. I mean, think of, you know, poor Voyager with its 161 kips <laughs> of processing capacity. Uh, the second one was battery. Uh, it takes a certain amount of power to do this stuff, uh, and along with that you get the uh, slowdown in throughput. You send a signal up, uh, the elongation and response time could be 30 or 40 percent uh, from encryption. Uh, we're, we're better now than we were back in the 90s, but those are the kinds of considerations. And then folks would say, why the heck would anybody want to hack a satellite? Remember those days? Uh, younger folks may not, but like, why would anybody want to hack a website? So, uh, yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, any other? If not, thanks. Enjoy your day. <laughs>